Welcome to the Chamber's Leader to Leader podcast. I'm your host, Susan Spears, President and CEO of the Fredericksburg Regional Chamber of Commerce. My guest today is the Fredericksburg Fire Department Chief, Mike Jones, my good friend. Mike, welcome to the program. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and for our listeners, um, I've got a little bit of history to tell you about with Mike, but honestly, he got got here to the podcast studio um, like a half hour ago, and we've been chatting. And so we've been having a really great conversation already, and I'm excited to um, have one now that we will be sharing with you, our listeners. Um, Mike has been in the Fredericksburg, Virginia area since 1977, but he is a Virginia native um, here and he he spent his childhood growing up in the Virginia area from Northern Virginia and being all over uh, Virginia. So you're going to hear kind of he and I, also a Fredericksburg native, kind of have a, a, a an accent that our listeners from maybe around the world will be like, "What exactly is that?" So folks, this is a Virginia accent, right, Mike? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> um, and he's been involved with our local fire department since 1983. And uh, there's a whole lot to that story, like how you go from 1983, and listeners, I'd like you to visualize 1983 in your mind, whether you were alive then or not. I was, um, in in 1983, I was uh, junior in high school. Yeah. And so um, that was a good year, a lot of good music and things came out, but certainly um, the concepts of today's world that that, uh, Mike deals with now as a leader in in the fire, you know, industry – are so different than that first day that he stepped in and said, I'll do it. Um, And obviously must have had a great passion and everything. So I want to hear about that. Tell us about your journey from that day in 1983 and kind of just, let's just chat about it, your your story. Well, in 1983, the, the Fredericksburg Fire Department consisted of a total of 18 career personnel. There was a small volunteer fire contingent that, that showed up on calls sometimes uh, especially bigger calls. But the majority of the work that was done at that point in time, the day-to-day work was done by 18 people. That included the fire chief all the way down to the newest person, which happened to be me. Um, things were a lot different in Fredericksburg back then. We only had one fire station. Uh, I was actually hired before the city uh, did their last annexation where they added uh, land from uh, spots of county. So if you know anything about the Fredericksburg area, the whole western portion west of the interstate that was all Spotsylvania County when I first came to work here in 1983. Matter of fact, all the the uh, shopping centers and everything on Plank Road were actually in Spotsylvania County. We didn't right. provide protection there, uh, and we we took that over in January one of of 1984. So there was a, a lot of things going on in the fire department at that time. Um, we needed to have additional apparatus. We we ended up hiring four additional people after I got hired. Uh, just for that sheer purpose to to help provide additional help for that uh, that annexed area and and you know what you look at today is is lots of asphalt and and uh, hotels and bo- big box stores and everything like that that used to be a golf course and four or five working farms and it's it's hard to imagine from 1983 to 2022 the amount of change that has occurred in that western portion of the city in that time frame. And when I talk to the young people that I hire nowadays for being either firefighters or medics in the organization that may have grown up in the area or may not have, they're probably coming from outside the area now, it's like they see that and they say, I can't visualize that. And, and I actually lived through that. So it's it's pretty interesting to see the, the amount of change that what Fredericksburg was, mm-hmm. what, what you grew up in Fredericksburg mm-hmm. as, to what it is today. It's uh, Sometimes, you know, you would think if you could be, drop back in 1983 and then all of a sudden you're popped back in 2022 you look at it and say it's not the same place <laughs> it, it's just not and uh it's very interesting but you know i grew up in the fire service my my i, I call it the family business my dad okay. was a fireman oh that's um, cool he he retired after 22 years of work in uh in fairfax county so i uh, you know i i was hanging out the firehouse when i was a little kid and everything like that it wasn't Neat. unusual so you know, I, I call it the family business. And a lot of people of my age or even a little bit younger, a little older, that's how they got in the fire service. They started out their their dad, their uncle, their father, maybe even their mothers at the time with the rescue squad got involved in things. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of took off from there. And you kind of have to develop that passion. But I, I pretty much knew from, from hanging out at the firehouse and, and seeing things going on that 
you know, from about 10 years of age, that's pretty much what I wanted to do. I mean, I went through high school. I went and got my associate's degree, and, and then it was like, okay, you need to go get your bachelor's. And I said, nah, I'm going to go ride a fire truck. That's what I want to do. Love so it. that's what I went and did. And, and you got to realize, too, in order to get paid to do this job, most of it was done by volunteers. They got no money or anything like that, and that's the way I was. I, I was a volunteer over at the, the Falmouth Association over in wow. Stafford County. And, uh, you know, that's where I got my initial training and things like that. Um, But in order to get paid, in 1983, the only jobs available was working for the Department of Defense at one of the military bases, Quantico, Dowdron, Mm -hmm. um, Fort Belvoir, something like that. Or you had to travel to Prince William or farther north. The only paid portion in this area, other than four guys that worked in spots of A.M. Monday through Friday, was the city of Fredericksburg Fire Department. It was the only paid job between Prince William and and Ryko. That's really amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, if you wanted to work in a municipal fire department and you didn't want to travel out the area, that was the only shot. Mm-hmm. And when I put in for the job, they had at least 50 or 60 people competing for one opening. Wow. And, and I didn't get the initial job, but then they had a couple people leave for other reasons. And... If you know anything about Fredericksburg back in the day, and, and, and you've lived through it, uh, it was one of those times where the city was money hurt, and all the jobs were frozen, <laughs> yes. and they were trying to figure out how to pay the bills and, and everything like the that. The 90s. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So they had to get a special uh, permission from the city council mm-hmm. to hire two firefighters. And they hired myself and another boy from, from up in Orange County. Well, yay. And, and uh, you know, I got the job and came on the job from there. And, uh, you know, things have, have, have progressed from there. I was fortunate enough as, as the department moved forward that I was able to, to promote up into a, a leadership position, first as, a, as a, a senior firefighter that kind of led small groups of people when it was needed, maybe when the officer was off duty or something like that, and then eventually into the officer ranks. And then I spent about 20 years leading an entire shift of people, about one-third of the entire department, um, and you'd work on that rotating shift where you worked uh, every other day for so many days, and then you had so many days off. Um, and then eventually, uh, as I got older, and I, and I spent 29 total years on, on shifts. So that's, that's more than a career for a lot of people because the, the retirement is you only have to spend 25 years, and you got to be 50 years of age. I met that requirement, and I had 29 years of service. But an, an opening came up in the uh, administration section of the fire department to, to be the deputy fire chief, the number two person in the fire department. So I said at that point in time, I, I'd try for that job. I, it's, it's a little different job. It's not the hands-on job where you have the hose lines or you, you uh, patch up an individual that's uh, bleeding or, or has an injury or an illness or something like that. But it's, it's a job where you get things done for the people in the field. You give them the tools and the equipment and the ability to get things done. And I had to put in for that, and I was fortunate enough to get that job, and I did that under uh, Chief Allen for, for eight years. And then when Chief Allen decided to retire, they, uh, they were, uh, I guess they were crazy enough to put me in that job. I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> they, they uh, uh, promoted me to, to a fire chief. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody – I knew I was going to get the job in December of 2019 – but I had to wait until he retired in March. Well, it just so happened there was this little thing called a, a global pandemic that happened to hit the world, you know, and it, and it just happened to rear its ugly head in, in Virginia in March of 2020, like a week after or a week before I took over. So then I not only had the fire chief's job, but I was also kind of in charge of emergency management, which involves the whole scale of pandemics and natural disasters and everything like that. And I said, well, this is going to be real fun. How do I put all this together? Mm-hmm. So, uh, um, you know, I had to do that. And then naturally they wanted to do a video update. So everybody pointed the finger at me and said, guess what? You're going to be a TV star. I said, what? <laughs> so we ended up doing videos for like every week for a year, um, trying to keep everybody up to date with what was going on with COVID and how things changed. And, uh, you know, it was, it's very different. When you think about the world and you think about, let's go to the business community for a minute and and your job at the chamber and people that have private businesses. We came in, we shut everything down. Oh, yes. We basically shut everything down. 
Indeed. People stayed at home. Yes. Um, they were afraid to go out. They were afraid to go to the store. They were afraid to go do this. Um, there was no vaccine at the time. Um, mm. People were hearing about people getting very sick and dying, and they thought everybody was going to get sick and dying, and that wasn't the case. Um, but we shut everything down, and eventually we started to transition to doing business by mediums like Zoom yeah. and GoToMeeting and, and Google and mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams and things like that. Everybody was virtual, and we had people that could do telework. And the funny thing about it was everybody was staying home, and everybody was trying to do their best to, to prevent the spread of the pandemic, and they were scared to death. And the funny thing about it is I came to work every day. I worked in my office every day. I had to be in my office every day. There was no way to stay home and, and do anything. I had to be out there in the forefront of it. And when you think about businesses and you think about my position as an emergency manager, I'm responsible to give advice or things to not only the, the city government, but to the people out there. They want to hear what's going on. What are the numbers? Everybody lived by the numbers. I don't know that, that was the greatest thing. As we look in retrospect, I don't know that was the greatest thing to do or not. But everybody looked at the numbers. Oh, my God, the numbers are here. Oh, they're there. Whatever. We've got this. We've got that. We've got so many people in the hospital. That percent positivity. We learned about all those things that we never knew anything about before or maybe even understood, and we're not sure we understood it now, but it's, it's what it is. Um, and you're trying to figure out, I'm coming to work every day. I don't see what the big deal is. But when you sit back and you think about it and you think about those folks that are trying to run a business, you think about people that are in a restaurant, you're thinking about servers, oh. you're thinking about all those people, you're thinking about a small business person that maybe only has one or two people in their shop, nobody's coming into shop, how am I going to survive and everything like that? I'm scared to death, I'm staying home. Eventually we got into the masking, we put the masks on, and, and I'm sitting there saying, Nothing's changed for me. I'm still coming to work. I'm still doing the job. But I've got to put myself in their shoes. What are they feeling? What are they doing? How can I help them navigate this process? How can I give them the best information so that they won't be scared to death, so that they can get a good information, that they can make an informed decision for themselves? And that's kind of how I had to frame it. I had to, to kind of understand the business community. And I, and I tried to look at it from a, a government perspective, from people that are doing jobs that aren't emergency service related. They're more business type related. Mm -hmm. how, we get, how we get things done, you know. You know how we, one of the things that never stopped, really, other than the first couple months during the entire process, and it's still going well today in Fredericksburg. You <laughs> see it all the time when you drive around, is construction and building. Oh, that right. never really slowed down. Right. And, and those folks were out there every day. So how do I give them the best information? How to get the information to these people? And, you know, you had to do that. And then there was one of these little things that came up. It was a little blurb on the computer. It said something called Leadership Fredericksburg. Yeah. I said, you know, I thought about that. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll think about that. So I happened to have a meeting at the chamber one day. Yeah. And, and uh, I said, well, let me talk to Susan Spears about that. <laughs> I said, I'll ask her a few questions. So I did, and then uh, I put in for it, and I was very fortunate. I don't know what they saw in me, why they would even select me, but they selected me to attend the, the, uh, the course. And I said, that's great. And we had our first class, and that was pretty good. And then all of a sudden, mm. it went downhill again. And all of a sudden, we're doing these classes by Zoom yep. and everything. But eventually we got back to the point where when we graduated, we were back in session together and we built a bond with people. And, and the nice thing about it is I got to meet so many people in the business community that I never would have met if I just stayed in my little comfort zone of yeah. being a fire chief and everything like that. But that allowed me as a leader to build myself. Mm -hmm. That allowed me to be able to expand my knowledge base, to be able to to draw on these people that had experiences that I hadn't had. I've been involved in local government for, you know, 30 some years. And, you know, local government's a small segment and the public safety sector of that is even a smaller segment. 
And when you expand that out and you meet people that are involved in nonprofits and you meet people that are involved in in uh, different businesses for profit and things like that, you start to see the world in, in a different way. And it, it, it's, it's very interesting because it's something that I wasn't accustomed to, but it's something that I knew that if I was going to be the leader that I wanted to be in the fire department and put the fire department in the forefront for everybody, I had to make those connections. I had to get that experience. I had to meet these people. I had to understand how they think, what makes them what makes them and motivates them and drives them every day because that's going to, even if it's not the same as fire, fire department, it's going to be something that uh, I can take information from, I can take nuggets from that will help me make the fire department better and make it a better part of the community. Yeah, so um, listeners, he's very shy, can you tell? <laughs> um, you seem to have this natural ability to... Uh, think outside of yourself and think of others. I don't even know if you're aware of that, but the way you process and some of the things you've described to me, you're talking about how, how do I communicate with them? What, what makes them tick? It's like a natural curiosity in others. Um, does, that, does that go hand in hand with your wanting to help, like that passion around fire? Or how, how do you explain that? That's very... It is service oriented, but it's also a like it's solution oriented too. Well, I, I think that's the the thing about the fire department. The fire department, when it shows up to help you, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, an ambulance or a fire apparatus or a chief's vehicle or whatever it is. You've called us because you're having a bad day. You don't call us when you have a good day. You call us when you have a bad day. When when someone is sick and ill when someone has been injured they've fallen down they've been in a car crash whatever it might be their house is on fire their sheds on fire um you've had a an event like we had a couple weeks ago where we've had straight line winds come through and trees have come down and on people's homes or people's cars or the local electric lines are still charged but they're in the tree and the trees burning and things like that you're having a bad day and you don't know who to turn to call so you call the fire department and the fire department comes out there and we're results oriented. We're, we're driven for a solution. What can we do to make things better? There's some things we can't, but on most situations we'll do that. When I first came up in the fire service, because of the way we work with our rotating shifts, almost everybody worked a second job because they had the ability to do that. And almost all of those people were involved in the trades. They were carpenters, they were painters, they were plumbers, they were electricians. They installed this, they installed that. They always had something. So when you go to a call in someone's home and they say, I have an odor in my basement, and you walk down in that basement and you start smelling and say, "Hmm, that's electrical in nature. Let me start doing an investigation. And when you've done enough of it or you've been involved in the trades and said, and and, and the officer will look at you and say, hey, Mike, yeah, open up the the, the top uh, situation there on that uh, uh, hot water heater. It's electric hot water heater. Open the uh, the uh, target or the little uh, cap right there over top of that where the element is. Open it up. Look, see, there's your burned wires on your oh. hot water heater. That's wow. where you were getting the smell from. But it's those type of mm-hmm. things that we do. Or you know, someone says their house is full of black smoke. And we pull up on the scene, and I get out there, and there's smoke coming out of the house, and it's black, and you think the thing's on fire. But as soon as I step out, I smell that typical characteristic oil burner problem. It's an oil burner. You can smell oil smoke. You know what it is. And what happens is the the nozzle's gone bad. They've over uh, put too much in the firebox, and now all of a sudden the black smoke's pushed out, and it's pushed out throughout the entire house. The house is not on fire itself. It's just you need to get the oil burner shut down and ventilate the home. But it's those type of things that you do that you can save people money, you can save their time, and you can make them feel better. And that's what we're there for. The same thing, you know, sometimes um, just taking time with people and, and sitting down and holding their hand and talking to them and telling them, hey, I know what's going on. It looks really bleak right now, but it's going to get better. And, you know, being able to do that, I think it's important. But 
you know, it's important to be able to connect with those people. And I think that's where you're solution oriented. And I think that's where I take it when I come to the business community, they're solution oriented too. They want, you know, and most businesses are for profit. They want to make money and they've got to figure out how to do that. And they had to figure out how to do that in the pandemic. Let's go back and look at that. What did the restaurants do? Most of them that were dying in all of a sudden figured out how to do carry out yeah. or delivery or things like that to keep themselves afloat and to, and to be able to make money. And they didn't need as big a staff at that point in time. The staff was staying home anyway because they were scared to death. But they were a lot of those people were able to make that transition. They sat there and they looked at the situation. They analyzed it. And they said, how can I stay in business? Well, I can do this and this. The people will come out and pick it up, or I can drop it off on their doorstep. We can make things happen with different apps and things like that to be able to order food and pay for food and everything like that. And I can still have a staff that comes in, cooks the food. We can deliver it. They can come by and pick it up, and we can stay in business. And a lot of them did that. A lot of them were able to do that. Some weren't, but a lot of them were able to do that. But that's the way to reinvent yourself Instead of the standard uh, way of doing business, what the global pandemic taught us more than anything else is to think outside the box or think of other ways that you can reinvent yourself, especially with business, to be able to to meet the needs of the customer. And I, and I think that was really ingenious and, and interesting to see that as it went through. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's just so much there. Um, but let's, let's go back a moment. Um, so around December of 19, you you know you're going to be the next chief. And you've had all these years, all this experience, a great passion for what you do. So between December and March, you've, you're probably getting this mindset about what you're starting to visualize and think may be your leadership role. And then it happened. Um, everything changed. So much change. And then you, you were in this, you mentioned it, but this, this role in our community what, you were like the COVID czar or something like, <laughs> like we're the, the, the conduit that like, I don't even know how, why, eh, but you were the one, um, you're, you're, here he is, he's a fire chief, but you're the one sharing a lot of this information for people and so forth. And you had to pivot, pivot, pivot. I hate that word cause we use it so much, but it's true. And it was nothing like all those years of experience, everything you planned for. I, I'm just wondering, like, just, did you even get to breathe? How did it feel? I know you said I had to go in every day and da da da, but you know, I mean, it just was so different than what you were most, visualizing. Most days in businesses and in, even in the fire department, you get into a routine. Mm-hmm. You know how it works. You know how it goes yes. forward. And once the global pandemic came, the routine was gone yeah. because you're trying at. at at our level in public safety, to give that information to the people. You're trying to find the best solution. You're trying to find the most accurate information. And it's very frustrating in the fact that the information that you're getting is changing by the day, yes, the hour, and certainly by the week. You've gone through five or six renditions, and what you told people on Monday you were telling them 180 degrees the opposite on that same Friday. And that's very frustrating because you're wanting to try to provide the best information, but people were giving you information from sources that you were trying to not only trust, but also verify to make sure that Mm -hmm. they were correct. And you were getting conflicting information or people that you trust or you're supposed to trust, the CDC, the the, the government, and and things like that, you know, people that were – involved in COVID, WHO and everything, they were all giving you mixed messages. And so you're trying to craft a message that you feel that is accurate enough that you can give that information to the folks out there. And it's very difficult to do that. And so you're trying to constantly change things. I mean, there were many nights that, you know, I had to stay well after normal business hours just to try to put things together so we'd have something for the next day. And and then... you know, if there's if the numbers haven't changed, which everybody was hung up on the numbers, maybe even me too, it's like you got to give them something more than that. They're not going to keep listening to you if the only thing you do is drone on about the numbers. You've got to to give them information. You've got to give them some type of something that they can 
take back and use for their own benefit or at least process and make an informed decision on themselves. So that was tough. And then, you know, we just got to the point where we were starting to get the hang of that. And all of a sudden, boom, I get hit with something else. Civil unrest. Oh, my God, where'd that come from? And it's like, you know, the natural narrative with with George Floyd and and all those unfortunate events. And then all of a sudden here in this town that I thought I'd never, ever see any of that, we've got people marching up and down the streets. We've got people blocking intersections. We've got, you know, police officers, and we've got rubber bullets and tear gas fired. And it's like, oh, my goodness, what's going on here? It's like everything's gone upside down. You've you've put it into a box and shaken it all up. And then I'm trying to figure out solutions for that. I mean, you know, we go back and we've developed plans in the past for civil unrest. But that stuff was developed in the 60s 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. And I said... Now I'm in the the 2020s. I said, the people are different. The issues may be similar, but they're not exactly the same. But trying to navigate all that, not only in that, but also still in the pandemic, it's like you're you're really trying to, to figure out where everything is and what's going on, and your entire world is turned upside down. So if you're at home watching on TV or Facebook or whatever else medium you have out there, that's one thing. But when you're out there living it, that's that's a whole different environment, trying to trying to give the information to the people so that they can make conformed decisions and then trying to do what's the best interest of the citizens of the city as well as the city government itself. So, you know, it, it's you learn to pivot very quickly. Like I say, you hate to use that word pivot, but maybe you move from one spot to another. Um, just based off of the information you're given and trying to, again, you know, you have to go back and look. What is motivating these people? What is the underlying issue? You know, we can chant and, and say obscenities and everything like that. That's only a symptom of the problem. The problem is underlying that. What is the actual problem? And then to try to understand that problem and see what solutions we can make is something that, doesn't necessarily get the forefront in the news, but it's the things that you work really hard at as a as a local government, as a business community, as a community in general to try to make those things work. Yeah, I'm I'm just taking it all in, visualizing, remembering, <laughs> um, so much, so much. And I actually, told you, Mike, our time would go by quickly. You know Absolutely. That. Um, and so we're already at the point to wind down our, our time together for this particular interview. So what we've done so far is just shared a broad spectrum, really, with our listeners of kind of a few days in the life of what it's like to be fire chief here in the Fredericksburg, Virginia area. Um, so it's ever-changing, and then at times it's solid and the same. Um, it's all backed up, though, in years of dedicated service to the community and really that passion you have. Um, it, you have to have it, I think, to, to do what you do, um, to fight fires and save lives. Yeah, that, that's, that's the mantra we have in the fire department, fight fire, save lives. It sounds simple and it sounds easy to do, but it's not because it becomes very complicated anytime you bring the human element into it. Yeah. And... You know, the thing about it is, it's to me, it's not a job. It never has been. It never will be for as long as I do this job. Um, it's always been a passion about helping people, about doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason, um, and, and trying to make uh, the organization better, the fire department better, so that they can better serve the people and, and to help the people in their time of need and everything like that. But you got to have that passion. And and that's what I look for. It, it's hard when, and you've done it before, when you interview new people for a job. Mm-hmm. You're trying to sit there and with those interview questions, and you can only do so much with them. You're trying to find out, does that person have that same passion that you have or that passion for that job? Are they there to help people? Or are they there to, to do that? Uh, public safety, by its very nature, doesn't pay the greatest in the world. Never has, never will. I get that. Um but you've got to find those people that have passion, that want to do that, that are willing to do that. I mean, for people that are willing to sit there and, 
and uh, run into a building that's on fire when everybody else is basically leaving and heading the other direction as hard as they can go. Um, it, it takes a special person to do that that's willing to do that. It takes a special person to have that compassion to sit there and, and hold the hand of a of a person that you know may be dying or something like that, that that doesn't have any friends or relatives around, that you're trying to to take them to the hospital to try to get them better or make them better or things like that. It takes a special person to be able to do that, and you're trying to find out in those interviews those people that have that passion. Because if they have that passion and you can continue to stoke that fire in them, they'll be a very good employer, a very good person to do that for years and years and years. And I think that's the problem that some of the folks have, and, and I, I'll experience it probably sooner rather than later, unfortunately, and that is what do you do with that once you retire from that job? Because once you're gone from that job, you take that avenue out. How do you take that passion that you have and how do you redirect it in another area of something that you want to do? So for anybody that's out there that's not involved in a fire service or public safety or anything like that, if you're getting ready to retire, what's your passion? Do you have another passion that you want to do that you can redirect your energy in that for for the years that you want to do that type of work? Because it's important to have passion in whatever you do. You have great passion in what you do here at the chamber. It's very obvious to see that um, in, in the conversations we've had. And you've got to have that passion. And you've got to find those people to have that passion. And I think that's one of the things that's toughest today in today's world Um with everything that's gone on with the great resignation and everything else that people talk about in today's world and the business community, can you find those people that will work for you, regardless of what segment it is, that have that passion to do that job? Are they there? Are they only motivated by money? Because if they are, they won't stay. But they've got to be motivated by something else, and that's something that we've got to find in the fire department, and that's something we've got to find in city government, and that's something you've got to find in the business community of, What drives those people? What motivates them? Because money is not going to be the all-driving factor. It's an important part. Everybody wants to make money. Everybody wants to be able to support their families or themselves and everything like that. But something else drives you. You know, it's the old statement. uh, You know, it probably has to go back to leaders. And we talked about a leader-to-leader podcast, you know. I'll move that (laughs) into there. But, uh, you know, what kind of leader do you want to be? How do you lead people from the front or behind or from the middle, and they can do it all three different ways to do that, to lead those people forward because people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're a really good boss and you have that passion and you instill that in people, then I think even if they're not making a dollar more than somebody else, they'll probably stick with you because they like the job they do and they want to do that job. And that's an important thing to find. Yeah, passion for your work sure does make a difference. And I'll tell you, we can, everybody listening can tell that you've got it. And also, I'm sure some are thinking, boy, I wish we had him in our community. Uh, What dedicated service. So thank you um, for all that you do uh, through good times and bad and and so forth. I look forward to getting together with you again here on the Leader to Leader podcast and talking about some other things as well. So I think we've just um, touched the tip of the iceberg here today in our fiery discussion. That was me attempting to <laughs> sort of have a pun- Y'all just don't. don't uh, it wasn't good. Uh, it was anyway, all right. I it was liked all right. it. <laughs> He's biased. Anyway, um, we're, we're going to go ahead and, and, and wrap it up here, Chief. But um, thank you for coming in today and chatting with me and sharing a little bit about your perspective and what you do. And um, you just do such great things for our community, and we're lucky to have you here as the chief of the fire department in the city of Fredericksburg, Virginia. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time greatly, and uh, you all be safe out there today. Thank you. I'm Susan Spears, host of the Leader to Leader podcast. We thank you for listening, and we look forward to seeing you next time.